Mate, today I am super excited. We've got a, a very special guest once again. Uh, I always love talking to this bloke. If you don't know who he is, you, you probably have seen him somewhere. He's a TV presenter. You know, he's, he speaks at events. He's an author and an educator. Uh, he's, a, he's a big media expert and, you know, he's, he's he built a pretty significant portfolio himself. Uh, he's not related to Gandalf the Grey, but he is definitely as wise. But Chris Grey, welcome to the Property Pals. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. Yeah, super excited for this one, Jordan. Um, I've never met uh, Chris before, so super excited to dive into this one, Chris. Uh, yeah, just a wealth of knowledge, mate. I've read your book um, front to back probably three times. Um, super inspiring stuff. It, it kind of really, um, everyone says that Rich Dad Poor Dad is is the one that kind of gets them going onto the journey. But Chris, for, for me personally, your, your book was kind of the one that kind of took me from property number kind of like one to go, okay, there's, there's more in this. I can, I can really excel. Um, and that's actually in all honesty, where I found out about the whole idea of extracting equity to then go and, and buy the next purchase. So um, yeah, really excited for this one. And thanks so much for, for what you've done for me personally so far, Chris. No, good. And look, rich dad, poor dad really is the Bible on wealth creation. And um, I think I came across it probably about 20 years ago, but I think it was out maybe 30 years ago. Um, but again, being kind of the US and stuff like that, things are different. He talks a lot about positive cash flow. And so what I wanted to put in my book, so I used to run an education business and we moved to a buyer's agency. People said they didn't want to learn how to do it, just do it for us. So literally we put all the information in the book, which you don't normally get because people are trying to sell you five books and then 10 books. So they want to try and drip feed you. But my idea is give them everything and they'll either go away and then they don't bother me because they'll do it themselves or if they want to use me, they've got most of the information and then they'll come to us. So we're not wasting lots of time. Yeah, that, that, there's some great points. And uh, you've even got the second book out now, which I, the, the the title's passed me. I think it's like how to live like a millionaire without yeah. being a millionaire or, or, or something like that. I got the uh, delivery yesterday from uh, Amazon. So it's uh, how to live how the to... life of a multimillionaire without being one. So uh, that's I all about it. The, my book's all about how to make the money and this is how to spend it. But even if you're not super wealthy, how to get all the big big boys' toys or girls' toys, um, but without having to be super rich. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen to crack into that one. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. But I think what really sparked my interest about wanting to get you on, firstly, uh, yourself and, and your portfolio. But I think secondly, is I saw an article that you posted the other day. Uh, and it was a, it was a, like, the, I think it was titled something like, you know, is, is now a good time to buy property? And it's a conversation I'm, I'm hearing all the time and a topic people are commonly asking me about and people are worried about, you know, missing out on the market or is it too late or, you know, have I, have I missed the bubble or whatever it might be. But um, what, what are people really asking when they ask, when they're asking you, is now a good time to buy property? Oh, look, it's, it gets a bit ridiculous after a while is, I mean, I've been doing property for say 30 years and everyone always says, um, is now a good time? And where would you be buying right now? And for my story, which you guys kind of know reasonably well is um, it's never changed for me. And when we've done Sky News, we've said in the GFC, in the credit crunch in 1819, in COVID in 2020, we've said now is the time to buy. Like I, I think every time is a good time to buy. And, and the classic thing is, is best time to buy is today. Uh, the best time was yesterday and the worst time is probably tomorrow. Um, but the thing is, is everyone's trying to time it. Everyone's trying to get super clever. You just need to get in the market. Sure, it's tough to get in now, but it's going to be even worse in six or 12 months. And in five or 10 years, it's going to be more expensive. You've just get a, got to get off your backside. So you've got to stop making excuses and you've just got to get in the market. It's, um, yeah, everyone's just trying to get too clever. Yeah, we love we love that, and like we've had previous guests on as well that have the same kind of philosophy and, and mentality as yourself. Like, it doesn't matter what kind of articles we see in the media about doomsday and whatever else. But, but how do you keep that kind of cool head, and how do you have the, the confidence to continuously like hold that stance that you've got? So it's easy for me. So I'm an accountant, so I've got no emotion. So it's super easy <laughs> to, to not worry about it. Uh, and look, it, even though that's a joke, it is reality. And the first speech I ever did was to CPA Australia, which is the accounting body in um, back about 20 years ago. And there's about six or 700 people there at Darling Harbour. And I thought this is going to be gold because the accountants understand the numbers. They're going to really get behind this. Accountants love property. I won't need another client in my life. This is going to be my whole database forever. And I don't think we've got a single one because the accountants get it. 
they get the numbers, they get the unemotion, and they get 95% there, but they're skeptics. And there's that little 5% in them that they won't go the whole way. But I've always concentrated on the numbers. And if you look at the graphs, and I think in that social media post, we put the graph of the last 20 or 30 years, is the graph is going from here to here. Sure, there's a few little ups and downs and the rest of it, which no one's ever going to be out of time. No one could um, forecast the GFC, COVID, credit crunch, all of those kind of things. And I speak to CoreLogic and uh, SQM Research, all the guys that publish all the stuff in the media. And sure, they've got an idea, but they can't guarantee it. And so you've got to be in for the long term. And I've recently started reading up about um, shares and stuff, just because I haven't got any and I need to diversify. And there's loads of books like The Barefoot Investor. Um, Anthony Robbins has got a big book on wealth creation. There's a whole bunch of them. And literally every single one, they say the same thing as they do about property is no one can pick the market consistently. So you need to buy the index. You go to a low cost fund that charges you a few percentage points and you buy the whole index and you hold on for the long term and you don't get in and out because of COVID or Bitcoin or whatever else. Same as with property. You've just got to be in it. It's a long term game and and it makes money. So yeah. another, another one of the things we say is our strategy is too simple for most clever people. So most clever people are trying to think, and I came from Deloitte, so all those clever people there, they're always trying to pick the market, find the latest thing, NRAS, like um, grants, all of this kind of stuff. And it's not, you just got to buy. So like you, you've got that philosophy of you buy and, and we hold. And, and this is a kind of question that I like to ask everyone. What's your kind of horizon? Is it, do you have a kind of minimum set period or are you just forever as your timeline? 30 or 40 years. So yeah. if I bought a property today, I can't guarantee it's going to go up in the next 6, 12, 18, 24, three or four years. I don't know. But I know at some point in the future, it's going to be more expensive. And it's like a forced saving things when you, when you buy your own home. You just need to hang on long enough until the market goes up. And it doesn't get much more complicated than that, does it? No, it's, and that's the silly thing. People think you've got to be that clever, but you don't. And look, sure, when you're starting out, there's a lot, it's complicated. There's so many different opinions, especially in the media. But what I've come to believe even more is property investing has almost got nothing to do with property. To be successful in property investing, you need to be able to get mortgages. So, We've bought, bought hundreds of properties. So I can buy a property, I can get it properly managed, I can get it renovated, I can get it knocked down, I can get it rebuilt, and all of that can be outsourced and it's reasonably easy. The key to buying more property and to be able to cash flow it and to have the money is finance with the bank. So that's really what I am is I'm someone that raises finance and I spend more time with my accountants and my mortgage broker saying to the mortgage broker, how much money do I need to earn for you to be able to refinance me. And then I go to the accountant and I said, this is how much I need to earn. And obviously legally and lawfully, we then need to run the business to get this number because that's what the number that the bank wants. And it's not to minimize tax. If anything, I'm maximizing my tax because rather than save a hundred grand in tax, I want to get another property that makes me a hundred grand a year for the rest of my life. And it's a completely different mentality to the way our parents brought up. Um, save money, look after the dollars, dollars or pounds, pennies, pennies, look after the pounds type thing. Yeah, and I think there's a whole shift in sort of the even your generation and the, the younger generation now about how they feel about debt and money and finance and saving. It's, you know, I think a lot of people are coming to the fact that it's not necessarily about paying down the mortgage on a P&I term as quickly as possible. You know, there's other avenues we can go down using offset accounts. And do we even want to pay down debt? Do we want to hold on to that debt and keep accumulating debt? As you say, and as we've commonly said, you know, it's really a game of finance and having that accessibility to be able to leverage and be able to borrow. But I think you touched on a really good point before in terms of, you know, everyone wants to be an expert in this space. And as you were saying with the, with the core logic chart, and, you know, we'll link it in the show notes if, if the listeners want to have a bit of a look at it, but it really does have those sort of peaks in 1989, the, the, then a bit of a dip peak in 2003, bit of a dip peak in 2017, bit of a dip. And you can see the commonality between, you know, the sort of peaks and not necessarily troughs, but the, but the little dips underneath that. And, 
you know, it's easy to see, it's easy to say now the experts are coming out and saying, you know, there's going to be a 30% increase in, in property prices. Well, maybe not now, but maybe earlier days. And then as the dips come back or the, all the bears come out and they sort of predict these 40% declines or whatever it might be. But why, why do these experts come out all the time, Chris? And even though they've been so wrong so many times before, they continually just come out and, and want to get a, have their input. So look, I don't necessarily know about their personal motivations, but um, when I was on Sky, I asked um, Peter Switzer, who's a well-known uh, TV presenter, why they keep getting these people on. And, and one of the examples was Steve Keen. So Steve Keen was the economist that um, had a bet with some guy from, I think, Macquarie, that property prices were going to drop 30 or 40%. I think he even sold his house in the inner west. And he basically lost the bet. And I think he had to walk from Sydney to Kosciuszko or something like that. Uh, wearing a t-shirt saying I got it wrong or something like that but Steve, Steve Keane I think has now moved to the UK and I don't know if it's because of that happening or something <laughs> like that in the market and look I don't, I don't know him so uh, I don't want to cast aspersions on anyone but the reason Peter said that um, people like that still get airtime is and I'm not a journalist but supposedly in journalism is you've got to have equal sides of the story so if you've got one positive person you need a negative person to have a balanced media and so these people, because they're always on the opposite side, and there's the, who's the big US one? There's a US one that always comes out, spruiking uh, the crash as well. Can't remember his name. Something Dent, isn't it? Something Harry yeah, Dent. Harvey, yeah. Ha ha Harry Dent? Yeah. Harry yeah, something Dent? like that. Yeah. Yeah. And these guys always get airtime because it's the current affair type story. It's sensationalism. And so with Sky, I never had the biggest viewership because my strategy was, read the Empire book, and I'll tell you it's okay today, tune in a year's time, I'll tell you it's still okay, and then tune in it every year. And obviously the boss of Sky wasn't overly happy with that because of any viewers. <laughs> but that was the truth. And I'm trying to, I guess, uh, translate the media into everyday language for people to say, look, I don't really worry about interest rates because in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter as long as you've got cash flow. And so... I, I don't have massive followings because I'm not out there saying stupid things. And so I just say buy and hold for the next 40 years in a blue chip suburb, hold on for the long term. It's not sexy news. It's not great marketing. We don't get millions of people coming to our um, database and our social media and stuff. But the honest thing is, is it works. And, yeah, and that's and it, the reality. And we, we kind of said it already, like it's basically as simple as that. And just speaking about that, about that as well, like there's heaps of rhetoric, particularly in like the property investment space that we've got to be buying thousand square meter blocks of land. You must buy land. We, we have to buy as, as big a land as possible as well. And apartments are, are crap. Um, why have you gone against that? And why have you gone, um, not purely, but like I know your portfolio, you, you're concentrated in the blue chip areas in the eastern suburbs of Sydney in particular, and, and you're okay with those strata titled properties. How have they performed with, for you personally over, the, over the, the, the short to medium term? Well, look, they're worth about 20 million, so I reckon they've done okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, one thing is, say going back to those core logic graphs, where we get that graph of, of kind of the ups and downs and stuff, that's average Australia. And so, or average Sydney or average Brisbane or Melbourne. It doesn't mean that all properties are doing that. So certainly when I bought a, I bought half my portfolio in the GFC, which was units, as you say, in the eastern suburbs or kind of um, the blue chip suburbs in Sydney, and they weren't going down in the GFC and they weren't really going down in COVID. The ones that were in massive high rises or house and land packages and there's massive oversupply, they were the ones dropping 10%. Mine might have been creeping up at 5% and then the average is then minus 10 or something. So... What, what I've learned, so I learned from a guy before Seven Steps of Wealth, uh, John Fitzgerald, a fairly well-known book, and he always talk, talked about um, land depreciates and buildings depreciate, which makes sense. So you want the highest content of, um, of land, which, which again, makes economic sense. But again, is the reality is he was selling house and land packages, so he has got a slight bias. I'm not mm -hmm. saying he's wrong, but he has got a slight bias. And that's one thing to read into with the media and anyone spruiking stuff or, or selling stuff is what's their motivation to say a certain thing. So what I learned from uh, a guy, John Edwards from Residex, who's uh, on Sky for about 10 years with me, and all he did was stu study capital growth is it's actually about the quality of the land, not the quantity. 
So say if you've got a million bucks, you can buy a one better, maybe a two better if you're lucky in Bondi. In Melbourne, you could buy a semi or a townhouse for that million. In Brisbane, you could buy a house. And in the Northern Territory, you could probably buy a thousand acres. So definition would say you go to the Northern Territory and get a thousand acres because that's the most amount of land. But on a sunny Saturday, when you're looking for renters or buyers, are you going to have a queue of 50 or 100 people going down the road to buy that Northern Territory property or rent that Brisbane house? My argument is, is no. So it's actually about the quality of the land. And also the thing is, is ideally you always buy around the median price because that means 80% of the local population can afford to buy it or rent it. So it's always in demand. So my rule is, is buy what the median price buys you in that area for what the average person lives in. So in Sydney, I'd always buy a unit. I wouldn't buy in a block of a thousand, I'd buy in a block of 12. So it's a different thing. In Melbourne, I'd buy that um, townhouse or semi. Anywhere else in Australia, I'd buy a house because that's what the average person lives in. And so I reckon a square meter of land in, in Bondi or Manly or Balmain or Marrickville or something like that could be worth five or 10 times as much as something in Brisbane or Queensland or Adelaide or the Northern Territory. So there's no one right rule and it depends where you're living and what you're trying to do. I didn't know uh, Fitzgerald was selling house and land packages. That's, that's very interesting. And I guess the, that the land component comes out there and that totally makes sense. I mean, he's always been a big advocate for it and I've read the book too. And yeah, that, that makes so much sense now. And I guess, you know, one thing Joe and I really, or we always talk about you in terms of your portfolio and, and the types of assets that you go after is this, this sort of apartment style and, you know, things you were just talking about then about buying, 80% of the population can afford it. It makes sense, right? It makes sense in terms of fundamentals. And I think you touched on a few really key things there, uh, but is there anything else in terms of when it actually comes down to asset selection that you're looking out for? Like, is there, are those kind of just the two really big fundamentals or is there, is there sort of anything else there that you, you, you generally look out for when it comes to choosing an asset? Yeah, so the main other thing is the number of industries. So you don't want to be in a one horse town and the idea of going Sydney, then Melbourne, then Brisbane, then maybe Perth and then the other states is the number of industries supporting them. So we know, for instance, Perth has major ups and downs with mining and stuff like that. So if you're in the industry and you can pick it, sure, go and buy in those areas, get the peaks and the troughs and that's fine. But most people aren't that clever and most people don't know that much stuff. So that's why I say the ultimate, I think, is Sydney, not because I live here, that's where I'm invested. And again, going back to the John Fitzgerald thing is there's a lot of people could say, oh, yeah, Chris, you're a buyer's agent, you're buying blue chip property, so you've got a biased interest, which technically I have as well. But the difference is, is all of my wealth, so my 20 million is all invested in that property because that's what I buy for myself because that's what I think is good. And the only reason I've got a business is people ask me, can you buy me one too? And so I buy exactly what I buy for myself. So it's basically the, the, the number of industries is really important. And then the main thing to do is to speak to the real estate agents, the selling agents to say, if I gave you one of these properties and you could sell it overnight, what would it look like? And then you go to the property managers and say, if I gave you this property to rent, what could you rent every single day of the week that you'd have a queue of the people out the door? And so I know in the eastern suburbs, Lower North Shore in the West, they'd say two better with parking, no lifts, gyms, pools, 500 metres to the beach or the harbour or the, the, the proximity to the cafes and the restaurants with parking, nice double-sized bedrooms, bit of balcony, north-facing, so it's nice and sunny. Now, you going up in, up in Queensland, and I bought a house and land package before, and I said to the agent, oh, where's north? And I'd literally come off the boat in, uh, from the UK, and he said, why do you want to know where north is? Oh, well, it's sunny. Mate, we want to get out of the sun. <laughs> like... It's completely different. So again, is if you're in Melbourne, you might need something else. And that's where you need the local expertise to know what the locals buy and what is the rubbish they're selling to foreigners or people from interstate. Yeah, and I just I just love how you kind of dispel that myth about apartments are uh, uh, rubbish and it's, it's a bad investment. Obviously, your, your 20 million invested in blue chip areas in Sydney kind of speaks for itself. But I mean, Jordan and I know the, the lifestyle that, that you like to live. Does the strata element have something to do with that as well? Like sometimes you've got a house and you need to be repairing downpipes, gutters, roof tiles. There's kind of that body corporate that looks after that. Does that play into any, anything when you're holding such a large portfolio? 
No, not really, because I've got a couple in the UK, and even though they're kind of ones like the top half of a house, so it's like a duplex kind of thing, and the other ones like four units, but we look after our own and the maintenance and stuff. So if you've got a good property manager, whether it's them sorting things out or the strata, I'd actually say the property manager is better at sorting stuff out than the strata manager anyway, because you're making the only decision. So it's got nothing to do with the maintenance. It's morely, more the investment style of things. But again, is so when CoreLogic comes out and says, or they say in the paper, right, apartments are really performing badly. Again, that could be Green Square. It could be Parramatta, where there's thousands, if not tens of thousands of apartments. And when I raise the core logic, oh, what about Bondi? And, and I just say Bondi, not because it's the best, just everyone knows it. And they, they just say, no, that's a different story. And that's the thing is when you're reading media articles or you're reading data or something like that, even for, say, Bondi, they say Bondi's risen at X percent. But down at the beach, you've got six or 700 grand studios. You've got $20 million apartments. You've then got five or $10 million houses as you kind of come up from the beach. You've got high rises, you've got Bondi Junction. There's like 10 or 15 markets just in Bondi in the one postcode. But the media quite often say Sydney rose at this. How many markets have we got in Sydney or in Melbourne or Brisbane? And so that's the thing is, that's why I don't listen to the media. And even in a postcode, when they say, oh, the vacancy rate of Coogee is 3%, say, I don't care because I know all my apartments in Coogee are fully, fully uh, tenanted because they're in the right locations, they've got the right quality, they've been painted, they've got the right property manager, they've got parking, and they're in nice buildings. So yeah. I don't care that all the other ones that are on main roads that haven't got parking, that are managed by the owners, that haven't been renovated in 20 years, they're vacant, I don't care. Yeah, you touched on such a good point there. It really comes down to your own individual circumstances and how you're looking after your own properties and how they're performing. I think, you know, you've touched on it pretty clearly, but even the same street can have two different markets on it. One side could have views of the ocean and be significantly more expensive than the other side of the street that doesn't have it. So, you know, when they're talking about Sydney wide, think about how many streets are in Sydney and how they, they vary. So yeah, I think they had some really good fundamentals and maybe just a, a bit of sneak, sneak peek into your book. I've, I've downloaded it and I'm about to read it, but can you give us some, some insights on how to live that uh, millionaire lifestyle? Yeah. So from the old school generation, um, everyone had to own something. And if you were rich, you had to say, say in the UK, when they had a new car, it used to come out with a letter of the alphabet in August. So it'd be B and then C and then D. And so all the super wealthy would buy their cars like on the 1st of August so they could show off to the neighbors, they've got the latest car. <laughs> um, and that was the way of recognizing it. Whereas obviously in Australia, we don't have that. So unless you really know your cars, you wouldn't really know how old the car is. And so, my thought these days is, or a lot of people's thought is, who cares about owning it? The new share economy, like the Airbnb, is if you can use that asset whenever you feel like, without a lot of the grief of owning it, why own it? And so some of the examples are rent vesting. So the idea of that is most people can't afford to live in the house they want to live in the suburb they want. And so the idea is, is very expensive houses actually rent for pretty cheap percentage wise. So the one I'm in at the moment, we're in Darling Point, we've got a whole floor 360 degree view. So they're not TV screens behind that's, that's the view. Um, an apartment sold for roughly about 7 million a couple of weeks ago. And we're paying about 1600 bucks a week, which is like a 1% return or something. Because under the old thing, how many people can afford seven grand a week on rent? Not many people. So the price goes down. Of the people that could afford seven grand a week, how many people want to rent? Well, not many people because technically poor people rent. That's the social stigma. So the price comes down even more. So effectively what you do is you go and buy those Coogee Bondi Manly units for like a million, million and a half, like Monopoly, those green houses. And then you rent the hotel on Mayfair or Park Lane because I'm renting mine for say two and a half to three and a half percent. And I'm only paying 1% myself. So I get much more for my money. Then say on the cars kind of things, so I put up that um, I, a Lamborghini was cheaper than a BMW. So I bought a 750 grand Lambo for 250 grand, about 2005 Merce Lago. And it's because it's depreciated. 
I held it for seven years. I did 50,000 Ks in it. So it's one of the most high mileage Lamborghinis in Australia. And I sold it in the week of COVID. So a year ago for 40,000 more than I bought it for because they're a rare car. Whereas if you'd put 250 grand into a brand new Beamer or Mercedes seven years ago, that car would be worth 50 grand or something. And then the same philosophy goes for boats. So we had like a one and a half million dollar boat, which most people would never use that much. We bought it in a syndicate. So eight of us put in 200 grand each. We owned it for three years. We got a hundred grand back. So it cost us a hundred grand over three years. So like 35 grand a year. I bought it with the mates. So we paid 17 grand each. So for 17 grand, I'm driving a one and a half million dollar boat that technically you get about 40 days, which most people would never use. But because I don't work that much, I use it during the week. We use pretty much every single day of that, if not more. And I get the whole value of that one and a half million dollar boat without the grief and the cost is split eight ways for all the expenses. So it's just a different way of thinking about things. Yeah, it's incredible. Like how, I'm, I'm just looking behind you there and every now and then you see the the sun hit a bit of water there or hits a boat. So we, we can definitely um, validate that that uh, wonderful view behind you is definitely real. How do you kind of get that mindset though? Just because it's so contrarian to everyone else or the way that we were brought up, like why would you rent? Rent money is dead money. How do you change that mindset? Sure. And look, I, I was brought up that way as well. So I bought my first property at 22 because I moved out of home. And that was the philosophy for my parents is you buy your home, rent money is dead money. But I just, the more and more I got into it, I, I just realized that there's a better way of thinking. And so my skill is basic mathematics. You don't need to be an accountant. You don't need to be a genius, but it's that basic mathematics is look to see what you'd love to, to rent, see what the cost is, see what the rent is and effectively work out the percentage and then see what you can do. So, so for the simple economics, say you go and buy a $2 million home in Sydney, $2 million, if you've got a young family, doesn't buy you a nice home really. Like you've got to go reasonably far out. So my thought is, is rather than upgrade from that million dollar unit to a $2 million home, why not just buy another million dollar unit and so say they rent out at three and a half percent, that's 700 bucks a week, two of them, you've got 1400 bucks. But that 1400 bucks, rather than renting a $2 million place, effectively, you could rent three or $4 million. So I really just kind of tried it and tested it. So the first one I moved into was a waterfront in Clavelli, which is between Coogee and Bondi. And um, literally, you could just smell the water, the waves were almost crashing on the windows. It was one and a half million, a uh, little, little townhouse, and we were paying 620 a week. And my flatmate didn't want to pay that much, so he paid 250 and I paid the rest, the 370 because I really wanted it. But I had, the, um, I had the, the bigger room and stuff. But to pay 620 for a one and a half million dollar property was just gold. So do That's you look at the, the kind of rental return? Like, does that play a big picture, the percentage yield, when, when you're looking to buy? No, not really. So not on the investments, because some of the ones I've had have been bad renters, but because they've been dilapidated and then we've done them up and then suddenly they've got a better rent return. So look, it gives you a guide. But all we buy is kind of one, two, three bedders in the eastern suburbs, Lone or Shore in the west, and we've done it for 20 years. So we know it inside out. Even though we know it inside out, every single time we buy, we go and pay 660 for a valuation. Uh, 440 for a building inspection and 250 for a strata. So the main thing is the valuation. So when you go to the bank and you get a mortgage, the bank will do a one or two page report. It'll probably cost them 200 bucks and the guy might, the valuer might not even go in the property. Whereas we get someone to do about two or three hours work. All they've done is Eastern suburbs property or kind of in a Westland or shore. And that proves that the property is worth say 950 or a million dollars. And they take into account all the rent and the rest of it. And they're completely factual. They're completely independent. They've got no emotion over this thing at all. So when we go and buy it, we know if it went to auction, it might get a million and 50 or 1.1, or these days it might even get 1.2. And so this is part of the reason why, going back to the original conversation, I don't worry about when I buy, because if I'm buying it on a conservative 950 to a million dollar bank vowel, I know that's cheap. But rather than say we get 10% off, we say that's market value. But most properties in blue chip areas in a strong market will get 5, 10, 20% premium. So my wholesale is effectively buying it for market value. 
And that's when I know if the valuer reckons it's worth a mil, I'm more than happy paying a $4 million for it. And there's a big value in that in buyer's agent. I think you touched on it before, Chris, but just having that on the ground research, you've been buying in the same place for the last 20 years. You probably know the streets in the ins and outs and like the back of your hand and, you know, you've done the research, you know what a property's worth, but you're still paying professionals to do that research for you too and, and to do the due diligence through the professional. So um, I think there's a lot of value in, in, in understanding the local market that you're in. And, and I think you provide a lot of value to your clients by doing that. But, mate, it's been a fantastic chat. It's always such a pleasure to, to have a chat to you. So insightful and uh, you got plenty of wisdom in there. And uh, if, if you're up for it, we'd love to have you back on again. But um, thanks for coming on, mate. Thanks. Look, I'm always happy chatting properly. As you can see, I just, uh, I love the subject and uh, happy to chat all day about it. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, we'll chat to you next time. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Bye.